In this video, we will examine how to incorporate the effects of an axial load into the stiffening matrix of a transversely loaded beam. The effect of the axial load in stiffening or de-stiffening of a beam has been shown in a previous video to be very important, especially in the case of column buckling or in the case of moderate to large displacements when your strain displacement relationships become nonlinear we're going to learn how to incorporate those effects into our finite element model, specifically into our finite element stiffness matrix. So as before, when determining the stiffness matrix of a finite element, the starting point is the strain energy, which can be written as the volume integral of the stresses times the strains. And in the case of the axial load, really what's happening is that the axial load is performing work as a result of the displacement in the axial direction. In order to examine this a little more closely, let's draw a figure. So this black line represents the underformed beam. In fact, this is a differential slice of the beam. And at some time t, the beam is deformed into the blue position. Let's label our x-axis. And the idea now is that this deformed beam, the blue line, has a projection onto the original x-axis that is somewhat shorter than the original length. We'll call this difference du then the length of the beam is dx, the differential slice, and the displacement in the transverse direction can be written dw. Then clearly the length of this side here is just dx minus du. In terms of energy principles, this work here is commonly known as the foreshortening work because this difference in u, which is the result of the transverse deformation of the beam, is also known as the foreshortening of the beam. Let's label this equation 1. And now if we pay attention to this differential element a little bit more closely, by Pythagoras' theorem, we can relate dx squared, which is the length of the hypotenuse, to the length of the other two sides. So that is dw squared plus dx minus du quantity squared. I can expand that out as dw squared plus dx squared minus 2dx du plus du squared. The dx squareds can cancel, and then moving the minus 2 dx du to the left-hand side, this can be rewritten as 2 du dx, just switching the order of that, is equal to dw squared plus du squared. If I divide both sides by 2 dx squared, I can rewrite this as du dx is equal to 1 half times quantity dw dx squared plus du dx squared. Then we can make the assumption that du dx is very much smaller than dw dx, which is true for a beam. As a result, du dx squared is negligible compared to dw dx squared. We'll number this equation 2. And then substituting equation 2 into equation 1 yields u equals 1 half the integral from 0 to L of P W comma X X squared. We'll write the shorthand form of it. W comma X X squared DX. And that is equation three. And then we can make the assumption that if P is constant, we can bring it outside of the integral and rewrite this as U equals P over two times the integral from zero to L of W comma X X squared DX. We'll number it equation four and put a box around this intermediate solution. And so we proceed in exactly the same way as our previous video. Starting with equation 4, we then assume what the function looks like in terms of letting w of x and t equal a function of x times a function of t. The function of x we call the shape function, and the function of t we call the nodal parameters. Let's give this a number, number 5, and then substituting equation 5 into equation 4, gives us u equals p over 2 times the integral from 0 to L, and then w comma x squared can be written as w comma x transpose times w comma x. So w comma x transpose would be q transpose phi comma x. Since I remind you q is not a function of time, we can only differentiate phi with respect to x, multiplied by phi comma x transpose times q. I remind you these are all vector quantities, and this is times dx. That can be rewritten by taking the time-dependent parts, q, outside of the integral. So we have 1 half q transpose times p times the integral from 0 to l, 
phi comma x times phi comma x transpose dx, and I've written this in green intentionally, times q. So what I've done is I've removed the time dependent part from the integral, and I've kept that in black, and everything that's not the time dependent part, I've written in green. I remind you that always a convenient way of writing the strain energy in matrix notation is 1 half times Q transpose times the stiffness matrix times Q. And now by comparing the green parts, it's easy to see how we get our stiffness matrix. Clearly our stiffness matrix K can be found by calculating P times the integral from 0 to L of phi comma X times phi comma X transpose DX. We'll call this equation 6 and a yellow box around this intermediate solution. So this is exactly as we've seen in previous videos when deriving the element matrices. So I can go through this pretty quickly. What we need is our shape functions and these are exactly the same shape functions that we saw when analyzing the transverse vibrations of a beam. A link to that appears above if you want to refresh yourself. But those shape functions could be written as follows where there are four different shape functions corresponding to the four different nodal coordinates, two displacements and two rotations. Since we need the first derivative of these shape functions with respect to x, let me go ahead and present those for you. I expect that all of you at this stage have no questions about that. Let's number the seven and put a box around those. So then what remains is to substitute these shape functions into equation six. So let's do that on the following page. Rewrite equation six. And now if we want to look at each individual element of k, that can be j equals p times the integral from 0 to l of phi sub i comma x times phi sub j comma x dx. And so for example, if we want to find the element in the 1, 2 position, then the 1 and this would be phi 2. And by symmetry, that would also give us element 2, 1 of the stiffness matrix. We'll call this equation 8. And then substituting the shape functions one by one into equation eight, we can find the geometric stiffness matrix as, and I'm just going to present it to you. We'll call that equation nine, and that is our solution. So what we have here is the geometric stiffness matrix for a beam with an axial load. In other words, we take our regular beam bending stiffness matrix, and to that we add the geometric stiffness matrix, and that will account for any axial load. What it also does in the process is it couples the axial displacements with the bending displacements. And it is this coupling effect that produces geometric nonlinearities when we look at non-infinitesimal displacements of beams, so large and moderate displacements. And with that, we have reached the end of this video. I hope you found something useful in it. If you have, please go ahead and hit those like buttons so that others can get to see this too. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for me, I'd love to hear about them in the comment section below. If you'd like to be notified of future video releases, please smash those subscribe buttons and click the bell icon. Thank you for watching, and I will catch up with you in the next video.